Cool, man. Well, other than that, I'm, I'll let you catch the intro. But okay. do we have to? Do we One, have to clap two. into it? We do actually have to clap into it. There we go. Wind it up. Welcome back, everybody, to an episode of the Professional Hippies Podcast. We have our host Colt Mewborn, Dylan Witten, and we just want to bring you know everybody down to the happy middle between the happy woo woo and the high achievers. And today we are graced with a high achiever that studies what the hippie woo woo people like to do. So, I mean, that background is pretty, yeah, I think it screams science, but there's a little bit of hippie. He's got the polo. Like he just got off work, but then he's like, my weekend is going (laughs) to be studying for you guys. So, (laughs) <laughs> we have Tyler Panzer on today. We're looking forward to getting into the science of everything that we love to do today. So let's jump into the opening and we're, we'll go right into it. All right, boys, let's remember our training. <laughs> Hey, Tyler, welcome to the show, brother. Welcome, buddy. Thank you for having me, fellas. Looking forward to uh, sharing some information with you guys, getting to know you guys as well. Well, no dialing very well, but looking to get you, to know you, Colton. Yeah, no, I, one of the things we were talking about, like yeah. literally at, before you're we hopping into the show, is just uh, conversations surrounding data or just like the way I would receive that is like a fact based conversation. And so I'm curious, like in the line of work that you do, or I don't know, just the stuff that you come by day to day, like how much does like the facts influence the type of conversations you're either having at work or the research you're doing, or before even maybe even segue into that, if you wanted to give like a brief synopsis of what you do and what a day in the life of you would look like. Sure. Yeah. So I uh, actually met Dion as my fraternity brother down in an undergrad at USF down in Tampa. Um, I got my bachelor's in some molecular biology there. And then I got, I recently finished my PhD in cellular molecular pharmacology up at Stony Brook University, um, like around two months ago. Um, and I just got first big boy job. I'm 28, finally getting my first actual job uh, up in uh, Stanford, Connecticut for a clinical genomics company. Um, so briefly, my PhD work was focused on breast cancer metastasis and tumor immunology. So how the immune system affects tumors. Um, but me personally, I've always had a huge passion for how, how you can do different things in your life and ingest different things to enhance your quality of life. Whether it be, you know, a creatine supplement while you're lifting um, or caffeine to be more focused and alert. Um, you could really... Um, drastically enhance the pros of your life while drastically reducing the cons by, I guess called, it is a form of biohacking, if you will. Um, So, and in the new company I'm at now, um, they actually just went public on the NASDAQ today, Semaphore. Um, They're essentially trying to use artificial intelligence and big data um, to basically when you go into the doctor's office to have your genome pulled up and give you a totally customized approach to your healthcare um, and what med- medications you might need based on your specific genetics. Healthcare right. in the past has kind of been a one size fits all model. I think this is really gonna be, the genomics field is kind of gonna be the future of this stuff. Wow, that is super cool. A lot of areas. You're Dude. covering a lot of areas. <laughs> that is super wow. cool. It, Cause I think you're totally right. Like that's something I've noticed. Um, like if you open up my cabinet, I have a green smoothie just about every single morning. So I'm packing all kinds of different nutrients in it, macro, micronutrients. But one thing I noticed when I put some collagen in there is like my body did not vibe with that at all, you know, and I got a like a really high, high grade, high quality version of that. And by everybody that was recommending to me, oh, this is a great thing to put in your smoothie. But it, it really is true. Like everybody's body's different. All the germs hanging out in our gut respond to different things. So 
what are you kind of finding when it comes to that, like individualizing what's good for, for different, are you noticing like any kind of patterns or certain things that are standing out immediately just getting into that first job? Yeah. So, well, so in the past, what I was doing for the past couple of years, 23 and me, are you guys familiar with 23 and me? Yeah. Yeah, So basically that's direct to consumer genetic where they'll sequence you. Um, And kind of just on the side for close friends and family, um, I would take their genomes and use a more advanced software just to kind of dig into it deeper because 23andMe, they sequence, I think, like 47,000 different genes and they'll only give you a nice, you know, detailed report with nice pictures and stuff for a very, very small amount. It'd be an incredible amount of work. Me personally, I don't really care if like, I have high odds that things cilantro tastes like soap. That's what they give you on the 23andMe readout. I care about, there could be mutations that'll make you absorb different minerals, vitamins, and nutrients much differently. So, I mean, basically to sum it up, like you can live a near perfect lifestyle. Like I personally, um, I always exercise, do cardio, high intensity weightlifting, um, eat super clean and healthy. And there were times, remember a couple of summers ago, I actually felt horrible And I eventually went to get blood work done. I'm a big beach guy. And in the summer, I went and got blood work done. And my vitamin D3 levels were absolutely in the gutter, super, super low, which made no sense. You know, vitamin D is the sunshine vitamin. And it turns out I looked into my genome and the enzyme that acts as vitamin D for when you get sunlight, um, I have two mutations in that, which means no matter how much sunlight I get, I will never get enough activated vitamin D3. So that was one of the first things where I was like, whoa, I live a perfect lifestyle, yet I was horribly deficient in this nutrient. So from working with a couple dozen friends and family, you know, it, it, there is some overarching trend that B vitamins and vitamin D, I say, those are, those are probably the two biggest things for people to get checked and that most people just really by statistics will have a, a higher chance of having those mutations. So how are you getting enough vitamin D? Is there just like, is there a supplement you can take that's activated vitamin D? Yeah, well, vitamin D2 is what your body has and vitamin, it gets converted into vitamin D3, the activated form by an enzyme. And you could take the vitamin D3 soft gels. And I've been preaching about this for probably two years now all over my Instagram about trying to tell people during COVID, vitamin D3 is so incredibly potent as an antiviral. Um, There have been so many studies showing over 90% of people that are hospitalized with COVID, they're vitamin D deficient and they can't have proper antiviral defenses. So me personally, I tell people to take vitamin D and they're like, okay, I'm taking a thousand IUs, but how do you know? I always tell people you should do blood work before and after you start the vitamins. Personally, I take 10,000 IUs every single day year round. A couple of weeks back, I had um, a buddy that got COVID. So I bumped it up to 50,000 IUs for four or five days. They'll actually inject people with 100,000 IUs. Now people get scared because you see all the zeros and commas after the one and be like, wow, that's a lot. But how do you know what works for you based on your own genetics, your own biology? You may need way more of that than, than another person based on mutations. That applies to all different vitamins and minerals. So where would you recommend people like get that checked? Like you can literally just go to your doctor. Hey, I want to get a blood panel done. Or is there like specific methods or channels you'd recommend going through? Yeah. So on the, on the typical blood form, blood work, that's actually not on there, but if you request it, it's, it's not on the routine blood work, but it's definitely not some highly sophisticated specialized test. So if you request that, um, you can definitely get that done. Cause I mean, vitamin D it's, It also regulates enzymes that produce dopamine, serotonin, and there's such a huge epidemic of vitamin D deficiency. And not only does the data suggest that that's leading to worse, poor COVID-19 outcomes, but also that's been linked to Alzheimer's, depression, anxiety, all these different diseases that addiction as well, all these different diseases that are plaguing, you know, America could it could possibly be due to these vitamin D deficiencies. Now there haven't been studies that are showing um, exactly that those can be the causations, but there have been a lot of correlative studies and the downstream uh, regulators of vitamin D do indeed suggest that. Me personally, I feel great. And I remember feeling horrible without it. um, And I consistently feel good. And I haven't been, I've just been feeling great when you're really dialed in with everything. 
Yeah. And I mean, you said you're a guy that's really big into fitness, cardio, just living a healthy lifestyle. And so I, I think that's a really big one, man. I want to like highlight, double click that. Like, so, you know, if I'm just the regular average Joe Schmo, I've never had a, I take that back. I had one blood panel done back in the day, but I just go to my doctor and say, Hey, this is what I want to get done. I want to get kind of some routine blood work, but also maybe some other, you know, what are some of the other things we can dig into and they'll bring that back to you and break it down for you and tell you what you're deficient in, what you need to supplement stuff like that. So you're referring to if I want what? to get my blood checked, you know, if I want to go in and see, Hey, what am I deficient in? What kind of mutations do I have in my genome? Yeah. Well, that's part of the issue. And I think that's kind of the gap that, um, the new company I'm working for is trying to address is that they're not traditional uh, education really isn't too involving the personalized approach for things. And, you know, you, you can't get mad at the doctors. Um, you know, that's just how everybody's trained. They need to learn so much information, such an absurd amount of information about the body. And now you're going to add a whole new layer, but okay, you learned all this, but wait, now everybody could be different about it. So um yeah, and I mean, I, I would say blood work wise, I think vitamin D and B12 levels are super, super important. But even that, for example, um, there's one gene that actually, so let's say you take vitamin B12, you actually, your body has to activate it in order for it to then do its job. And I personally have a mutation where I activate less vitamin B12 than I should be able to. And that I think around in Caucasians, and overall Americans, I think it ranges from 30 to 60% of all of, of, across all ethnicities that can have this mutation. So you're telling me around half of the people in the country or in the world have a reduced ability to activate B12. Everyone says, you know, take B12 if you're tired, it gives you energy and focus, but you could be taking all the B12 in the world if you're only activating, you know, 10% of it, what's it really doing, you know? And that's, the, 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 the testing paradigm, it's hard too. I think another issue is, you know, if you're between one and a thousand, you're, you're healthy, which is an astronomical large range. You know, like what, what if, what if I was 800 three weeks ago and didn't get tested, but now I'm here and I'm at 400, I'm still in the normal range, but that's half of what I used to be. So there's a lot of things kind of, I guess, impairing proper judgment Healthcare outcomes also, because they have to see, I know MDs, DOs, they need to see more patients than ever. You know, nowadays it's just, it's a numbers game. There's not enough doctors for all these patients. So how can you really give truly personalized, detailed treatment when you got to see, I mean, I don't personally see patients. I don't even know how many they have to see, but I know it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So, Cause you're in like, what you go to the doctor's office, right? You're in there. Hey, I want to get a blood work done. And what they get you four or five minutes to question anything you got and then they're out and then you know they'll look over your thing or they just send it to you and <laughs> call us if you have any questions about it i've gotten yeah, I, work I, I, a couple I, times on it and uh that's pretty much what it is they'll call me and just they'll say you look good and i get something <laughs> in the mail <laughs> you look good. Yeah. and then i look i look through it it tells you what it should be and then you know what range you should be in but then i'm like well even though i'm in the range i'm still lower over here what does that mean and i'll call them back up and then they're like well we'll call you back at whatever time to really go into detail with it yep well that's why i was yep. curious too because like you brought that up and i was like the only exposure i've ever honestly had to someone speaking to like what you're talking about and supplementing like hey this is my body this is what i'm deficient in tim ferris is kind of the only person i've ever heard talk about i love tim i love tim yeah yeah big fan of him yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, was I was like if you wanted to get blood work done like where do you even like if you wanted to get what you're talking about and i can appreciate what you're talking about with your company really wanting to step in and explore that space and and really blow that open because what right now that i mean that's not really a thing that, that's definitely not a thing that i've heard of um outside of tim ferris yeah, yeah. Because I mean, it's, it, it, yeah, and it's one thing to, I understand people not wanting to, you know, push the body and mind to the limits by, you know, biohacking to supercharge everything. But we're talking about just basic health at this point. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. there's, there's, there's supercharging the norm, and then there's correcting the deficiencies, you know, and I think that correcting the deficiencies can just, I, I feel like healthcare overall is, overwhelmingly focused on keeping the very ill. So think, you know, cancer patients 
keeping them alive another day or another week. That's what healthcare is pretty much completely focused on, which don't get me wrong, is absolutely a noble cause and needs to be done. Like they're not wrong for doing that. However, I think that I like to think, think of it as a little guy, the little guy being like, let's say me or the average person that suffers from anxiety or depression, maybe not, you know, super, super, super severe, but I think nearly everyone, especially nowadays in the pandemic, post pandemic world, anxiety, depression are absolutely through the roof and the, a regular person. So a normal person that doesn't need to be in the hospital, their quality of life is super, super low. And that's where I'm super, super interpassionate about trying to it, try. There's enough attention on the people that are nearly about to die with the cancer, with the immunotherapy. Like that's very, we need that. But how can we improve the health and wellness of, I guess, the average person? Because in my opinion, I think inflammation is the downfall. It leads to every single chronic disease, depression, anxiety, cancer, Alzheimer's, all these things. And I personally think that nearly everybody lives with subclinical levels of inflammation, meaning nearly everybody has inflammation to some degree. How many memes, it drives me crazy. How many memes do you see about, you know, midday being exhausted at work or something, or I'm tired all the time. I don't know if you guys saw there's like an Avengers meme with the Hulk and it's like, what's your secret? How are you never tired? That's my secret, I'm always tired. And it drives me nuts because it's like, you shouldn't be tired all the time, but at the same point, why are you tired? Because I remember that one time, this was several years ago, and this kind of what's got my mind thinking, just during the PhD, but got me thinking kind of outside of the box about things. I remember I was going to study, I had like a double espresso shot. And then like an hour later, I was just exhausted, super tired. And I'm like, why is this happening? I just had a bunch of caffeine, I should be very focused. And I think it was something with my knee was messed up from like squatting or something. And I took two ibuprofen to fix the knee. And right after I took the ibuprofen, suddenly I started becoming much more focused, energized, and alert. And I was like, this, this is very weird. I took an anti-inflammatory and suddenly I got stimmed up, which it, should, it doesn't really do that. So you don't need a PhD to figure out if I take an anti-inflammatory and feel better, that means that I'm inflamed. And that's kind of what got my mind thinking that me personally, I come to found out, I got allergy testing. I'm allergic to literally everything. I had no idea. I was eating peas and almonds, two of my favorite foods every single day. And I would never get a single hive, no bumps, no nothing. And I became to figure out that my allergic reactions all happened in my brain. They made me very foggy, lethargic, and tired. And I honestly think that's what's happening with so many people. I never would have said I'm this allergic to things. I'm allergic to cats and dogs. I had them my whole life. I never got hives, none of that stuff. So I think that let alone I eat very healthy, but people that eat fast food all the time on top of that, you're not aware of the inflammation that's affecting you. So I just tell people, you know, if you're ever feeling kind of down or fog, you're out of it, take an ibuprofen and see how you feel. If you feel any better, that means you're inflamed. That's the easy part. The hard part is figuring out what's causing the inflammation because it could be from anything. Well, that and the baseline of like, I mean, it, it does really boggle my mind, the people that eat out all the time. Like, let's even take fast food out of the equation. I know plenty of people that don't eat fast food, that consider themselves healthy, they eat out a lot, but they don't realize, like, when you go to a restaurant, unless you're going to, like, a really, like, organic, you know, free range, like, that's their mission statement, that's their belief, the value system that they want, you know, farm to table kind of business model they're going to cut corners. If it, something's fried, it's going to be fried in Crisco. If they're sourcing yeah, yeah. something, it's going to be farm raised fish. You know, they're not like most establishments, chicken, it's going to be Purdue. Like they're not going to be doing all organic, whatever, whatever. So it's like, even if the food tastes great, like there's a reason why they're trying to hijack your taste buds, you know? So that's something that take the fast food out of the equation. I mean, it's, you work out, eat green stuff. You know, and you do that a lot. Once you get to that base level, then kicking in the other stuff you're talking about just takes it to a whole nother level. But it's like, it blows me away that we're assigning all of these antidepressants and all these other modalities when it's like, hey, are you spending 30 minutes outside a day? Are you exercising? Are you having sex? Are you you're drinking enough water? Like those things right there alone work miracles in people's lives if you have that going on. But and then the next level is what you're talking about. 
you know? Yeah, and I mean, honestly, like, people ask me all the time, do you eat all organic? And I'm like, honestly, fuck no. I'm like 230 pounds, six foot three. Like, I, I would go absolutely broke eating that much, you know, organic stuff. Not yet. I can't afford that yet. I plan on going there. But me personally, like I said, I'm like, my mom it has really bad arthritis, like very bad. Like she passed on and from looking at her genome, she passed on her inflammatory genes onto me. So I'm triggered by like, I'll be feeling great in the morning, my regular food, and I'll just feel inflamed. So me personally, I'm sure you guys have heard of turmeric or curcumin. I take that every day. And that's, I'm always taking some sort of anti-inflammatory. And even if you ate perfect, the air we breathe is just filled with so many pollutants. Glyphosate, which is a pesticide, is now airborne. So there's there's no way you can totally, there's no way you could totally get away from the inflammation. People, like when people say like, why do I need to take all these supplements? It's A, like I mentioned earlier, your personal genetics can make you need much more of something than another person. But B, the world we live in, unless you're literally in the middle of bumfuck, like, like nowhere, like off the grid, you're going to be bombarded with all these inflammatory things. So how do you really get away from that? You know, it, it's really difficult. What are your thoughts on alkaline water? Alkaline water, I, I, I really don't think it makes any sense because people saying that drinking alkaline water will change the pH of your body. I will cell culture, like, like, you know, cell culture Petri dishes for six years. Which and by the way, you change... for anyone listening or watching right now, like, could you also explain what alkaline water is? Yeah, sure. Sure. So you have a pH scale. So that's how acidic or basic something is. So I'm trying to think if you have something that's, um, a low pH that makes it very, very acidic, um, versus very, very basic. Um, and now there's claims that drinking water that's alkaline, so most water is around a pH of seven, which is neutral. It's one to 14, and seven is dead neutral. Most water is around a seven, and people say that poor lifestyle, eating acidic foods, will change the acidity cells in your body. Um, and then drinking alkaline water, which is basic water, will help bring you to a more neutral state. But I did cell culture for six years, and altering the pH even a tiny, tiny bit in cell culture will, if not kill the cells, it'll completely throw off the experiment and change the expression in the cells. So like basically claiming that if you really could change the pH by drinking water, drinking water would really fuck up your body because the cells, your body is so tightly regulated to make sure that, you know, the water levels, the ion levels, the pH levels are all very, very, tightly regulated. So in my opinion, the alkaline water thing, like, and people try to claim that a lot of the unhealthy foods, see, the thing is a lot of healthy foods happen to be on the more basic side, like avocados, um, they happen to be more on the basic side. Um, people, but meat happens to be very acidic. But in my opinion, meat's not an issue. It's the meat quality. But how else could anyone afford to live? I mean, I don't even know how much organic beef is, like grass finish. It's probably like, I don't know, like $15 a pound. Like it's, no, it's, it's not, not more, much. it's crazy. It's not, it's not that much more. Is it? No. Oh, okay. It, yeah, I, I, I have mean, no idea, honestly. I go to Costco still, so you full Costco? disclaimer. But yeah, I'm, I'm a big Costco guy. I oh, got to buy a here. bulk. I eat yeah. a lot. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Big yeah. Costco guy. Yeah. I'm a big uh, Publix BOGO, whatever they got. Oh, dude, I fuck up their BOGO. <laughs> when that, when they, uh, when the, chicken breasts or bogo out of stock immediately oh, yeah. i'm taking it all because you're gonna eat it eventually oh, you know yeah. you are it's, it's an <laughs> stock up yeah i miss Publix, man i remember dude i remember when i first came down to usf i didn't know what wawa was and that blew my mind because right. they don't have those up in new york <laughs> connecticut i was like what's a wawa you want to talk about a fast food that i just refuse to cut out of my life it's right there yeah a, little, a hoagie well, you can get anything there you know like it, yeah. it's they, they have the subs there and they have everything else <laughs> I remember so many trips to Wawa in college. Like, we're all going to Wawa? All right. Oh, yeah. I mean, there was one Wawa, live, maybe. Uh, I'm in Stanford, Connecticut now. Oh, that's right. You mentioned that earlier. Okay, Connecticut. Yeah. 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 Uh, God bless you. It's <laughs> a bit different from Florida, huh? Yeah. I mean, I uh, I was grew up born and raised on Long Island, New York, and I basically took a four four year hiatus down to Tampa. So then I came back here. So it was. I still say y'all. That's one of the things that st stuck with me from Florida for sure. 
Um, <laughs> Watching his reaction to just learning how the South did things was incredible. But just like, yeah, yeah. What is this? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm an expressive guy, so that was a, that was a learning experience for sure. <laughs> you took a little bit of, of the South back up there with you, huh? <laughs> With y'all, I think that's pretty much it. But I use y'all because I'm trying to think now. What what was the old version of y'all for me? You guys, right? Yeah, guys. Y'all, yeah, you, you said, guys, right? You, you guys. guys or something? Yeah, use yeah guys. I think now y- y- y'all is just one syllable. It's more efficient. Like signing <laughs> up. I'm in. And I don't know if I've gotten used to it, but your your Long Island accent used to be hella strong. Oh, yeah. I, I think it's. Oh yeah, I remember everyone when I first got down there freshman year was just like, "You want to walk the dog to get some coffee?" And I'm like, "Yo, you want to leave me the fuck alone?" Like, <laughs> it was it was so good. Do you miss I have to say where I was from? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, under, I mean, looking back now, it's just so crazy. I mean, what 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 was our life back then like 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 go to class take pre-workout go to the gym go to another class and go home it looks like an absolute joke and you know my junior senior year like i was in the library like every single night but it was just a different kind of i don't know you got bills to pay now you know what i I mean back then it was like like it was it was just different you know what i mean i mean like it's undergrad was great i couldn't keep doing it at that rate you know what i mean but it's I mean, how can you not miss undergrad? I, I, yeah. I had an awesome undergrad, undergrad experience. Dylan made sure of that. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, no, yeah. believe me. I, great experiences. I hear the stories. <laughs> I hear the stories. <laughs> so you, uh, when did you start the position you're at now? You said that's like a really recent thing. Yeah, so it's been just about two months to the day. Um, and I mean, basically, I'm a data analyst there. So um, I'm basically just using Excel, um, looking at the data from the different seeking assays that our company has to report that. Um, so it's kind of basic, but you know, it's, I joined because I, I love the company because honestly I was planning on launching some type of personalized medicine company. And then I'm like, Oh, great. Like I, I, I met some guy at the gym and he happened to work for them. And I looked them up and I'm like, I watched the corporate video online. I was like, holy crap, like holistic, personalized, genetic back approach to medicine. Like this is where I have to be. So I I, I definitely want to be with this company. I think they're going to do really, really great things. I like to refer to them as kind of like the Tesla of healthcare, if you will, like kind of very very forward thinking um, and thinking long-term and trying to, I mean, me personally, my training at the PhD I was trained to test new drugs, develop new drugs. And I literally, part of my thesis was a mouse study where I genetically altered the mice with or without our gene and give them breast cancer and see how it affects breast cancer development. But me personally, I didn't want to go work for Pfizer or Merck and just be making yet another chemotherapy drug. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, some people do need them. Well, sorry, for, for, for chemotherapies, yes, everybody needs them. I was thinking more of the antidepressants, but people need them. But me personally, I think I think I could possibly impact much more people's lives by educating them and trying to do the more preventative approach. I mean, compared to things how it was 10, 20 years ago, I think the healthy, you know, woke, every that whole movement is all-time highs right now. I think everybody is at least on the same wavelength that like, you know, we shouldn't be eating fast food all the time. We shouldn't be doing all these things all the time. You know, people still do it. You know, I did it last weekend. I got drunk. I went to Taco Bell. I, I, I have no regrets about it. You oh, know what I mean? But it's oh, good on you, sir. Hell yeah. Well, well, they, they recently redid their whole menu and everything a couple of years ago. The healthiest I think fast was, food joint. Listen, do you hear oh, that's what I'm saying? <laughs> they redid the menu. <laughs> no, they did. There was a study that they had like solid meat quality and stuff, you know, I mean, that's far greens, from the norm, bro. but. Yeah. No, I hear you, man. I, I went out the other night and uh, this chick ordered a rumple mint. What is that? What is a rumple mint? You guys never heard of the a rumple mint shot? Yeah. Like the shot. Oh. the shot. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I just gave her yeah, this. Dialogue. We, we, we didn't go to the fraternity house. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I had, yeah. I had PTSD. I had flashbacks from undergrad. And I was like, are you serious? <laughs> She's like, no, it's my favorite. And I was like, immediately I jumped to uh, like Taco Bell or water burger you know it's just like 
2 a.m. trips where you're like in the back of someone's truck and everyone there's like a conglomerate of people ordering shit. And that was like every night. Yeah, Dylan, Dylan's truck. Yeah, Dylan's my truck. truck. We would we would haul people in the back. Oh of yeah, my and truck. you just pull up a little bit and people are in the truck bed screaming their order. You know, well you put the order in from the cab. And then they go, all right, next. And you only scoop up a little That's bit. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, you have people <laughs> out back just screaming their orders. I was like, oh, man. Paco put it. I think Paco was recruiting people every night to go to Taco Bell more than anybody. Yeah, he'd rally the troops. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, uh, you know, with with your studies up there and, and, and being, you know, being in the PhD and you're kind of in line of what you need to do to – Get where you need to be. Did you ever have any side studies that you enjoyed to do, uh, where you you know you had the equipment, you had the use you the the facilities, were you able to just be like, oh, I have this hobby that I want to do on the side, or like this is really what I'm passionate about. I'm going to use the equipment to be able to do my well, own. Yeah, regarding using the equipment, no. But honestly, like everything that I've learned, like basically none of what I just spoke about was taught to me in any courses of the PhD, was taught to me during the PhD or involved with my, my research. So like, like my side project was, you know, and don't, get wrong, don't get me wrong. The courses educated me on how cells work. You know, everyone's heard mm -hmm. of the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, you know, like those things, like it definitely helped me understand things much easier and better, but Regarding actual side projects in the lab, no, that's very, you know, that's that's very like clear cut. You know, you got to log every single mouse that you use for every different thing, you know. So it's oh, and honestly, like a I wouldn't record of everything that you're doing in that lab, I guess. Well, well, regarding the mice, yeah. So regarding yeah. the mice, there was every mouse needed to be accounted for if you euthanized one or took it upstairs for an experiment or if new mice were born. But ironically, I found out what maybe five years into my PhD about like a year ago, I found out that I'm severely allergic to mice. So <laughs> now I finally figured out time and time again, I'd be sore and high. I personally like to work out in the morning. So, you know, I have a plant-based caffeine pill and then I have like about a third of a scoop of pre-workout. I used to make my own pre-workout and like, I used to love getting, you know, stemmed out to the gills. And I remember it was, I put DMAA in it. It felt like an Adderall high. It was sick, but like, <laughs> You get, you get hooked on that shit, you crash hard, and now it's about sustainability. But I'd be sore and high going into lab, feeling great, and I go check on it, I come back up, and I would just feel like shit, super inflamed. I don't know what the fuck is going on. And turns out I'm severely allergic to mice. And I found that out like after five years of dealing with it, because once again, I never got hives. I wish I sneezed. I wish I got hives, because that would have made me realize I'm you. allergic to something. Mm -hmm. versus everyone gets brain fog or tired in the middle of the day. Like, I mean, I still do sometimes, you know, everyone's human, but like, like I wish I could have realized it back then and not picked up a mouse project, you know? And that was yet another reason for me to decide I'm definitely not going to go and do mouse studies at some big pharmaceutical. I don't want to be popping nine antihistamines every day. Mm -hmm. I wonder how many people yeah, are there in the same field doing my studies that don't even know they're allergic to it. <laughs> Dude, I have no idea. I mean, I'm just, I'm just really, really glad that like I was allergic to all these things. My fiance Mira, she used to always say, you know, it's in your head, this and that. Like, you know, I'm sure I could psych myself out sometimes. You know, it's knowing all these things. Definitely, at t I'm sure in the past I've been kind of a hypochondriac about things, but I'm you sure were, there's because in other college time. you were like that. You would be, you would like really overthink things in college, not in a bad way. You would just yeah. be like, "Why am I like this?" Or like we'd be yeah. hanging out, and you'd be like, "I shouldn't be feeling like this." And we're like, "Well, yeah, dude, you just did two a days in the gym. Of course you're feeling like this." Yeah, you know, yeah, it would be something. But then, like because of that, and the way you do things like that, that's why it's great that the field that you're in. Cause that's exactly. what you have to do in order to do that. Exactly. Exactly. And you know, she, like I'm almost glad that I was literally, so for the allergy test, like the arm skin prick thing, they have like four panels, I think like 20 or something. And I was positive for more things on one panel than most people are on four. So I was almost relieved to go home and say, Hey Mira, like I'm allergic to everything. So I was kind of right about that, but it also <laughs> sucks because you're allergic to everything. Yeah. Congratulations, by the way. You and Mira. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. She was a extremely, extremely 
patient lady. I mean, what we're going on like eight years. So we're at over yeah. eight years now. So yeah. Wow. Yeah, Looking back at photos. Just- it's like, wow. Holy fucking shit. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. I'm a lucky guy. That's awesome. Wildest couple. Wildest couple. Like in the gym and also had a great time, partied, everything. Just- oh, you got a girl that's about that gym life too? Oh, yeah. What did she? I think I think she 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 threw javelin at USF. And I think yeah. she got I think her one rep max for squat was like 335 and she weighed like 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 135, 140. Beast. Oh yeah, God. nuts. I immediately went to the gym that next day to make sure I could squat that. And I could <laughs> I just I just had to make sure. Like 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 me personally, I have very, very long legs. So like I, I'm not a huge I'm not a huge squat guy. Like it's just like it doesn't really feel I don't get my legs don't get pumped. It just doesn't work that well for me. So like I I, I don't do it that often, leg press and I do other things, but yeah, I had to go assess that right away. So I'm like, this, right is, away. this <laughs> just is wild for sure. This is wild. <laughs> yeah. Well, some of the stuff that you're bringing up around um like allergies and just overthinking in general. Do you follow any of the work by Dr. Uh, Rhonda Patrick? Oh yeah. Love her. She's, she, she's on point with, I agree with pretty much everything she says. Like I, I just, I just copy paste what she says. No, I think independent <laughs> sometimes, but she's uh no, she's, she's awesome. She, she, she sums up, she sums things up very, very well. And like, I feel like, the future me, I feel like I want it to be like a Frankenstein conglomerate of like a little bit of Joe Rogan, a little bit of Bill Nye, a little bit of Rhonda Patrick, you know, like a little bit of all these different personalities because yeah. she's, I love her work. She's, she, and the cool part about her is that what she talks about, she actually has her own lab and researches it. You know what I mean? Like I'm looking at data and at papers and making my own assumptions but she's actually like on the front lines, actually out, doing researching it. these things herself. Like uh, we found out this, like, yeah. I don't, I don't work in that lab anymore, but it's like a lot of respect for what she has accomplished and what she's doing. Cause she's definitely on the right track. I always suggest it's crazy. I'm at the age now that some of my friends are starting to, you know, get pregnant and have kids. And I always forward her article. Like it's a very, it's very in depth, but easy to understand. Um, just summary of prenatal vitamins, what you take, which trimester and why, and what you take while you're breastfeeding. Um, Cause you know, what, what your, what you ingest while you're breastfeeding still goes into the breast milk. A study I actually found out that was pretty wild was showing that giving mice alcohol or marijuana, giving male mice alcohol or marijuana will change. So I guess I should describe this first. So genetics, your genome, that's the letters that make up your genetic code. And those will make up genes. Epigenetics are when you could turn on or off whole segments of the genome. So it won't change the lettering, but you could flip them on or off. And giving male mice alcohol or marijuana before they mated, that would actually change the epigenetics of their sperm, which Whoa. would impact their type, like their offspring, to have more anxious or ADHD-like tendencies. So me personally, when I plan on having kids, oh. I'm going stone cold sober for like, I don't know, at least four to six weeks beforehand. Like, yeah, yeah. That, that kind of blew my mind. And that's what made me think, you know, like, does that also happen with eggs as well? Like probably, who knows? But right? I, I, I know me personally, I know, I know my mom, they were, she was celebrating her 30th birthday and was like having a great time partying. And then like the next day or two, she found out she was pregnant with me and I turned out okay. So clearly it's not, you know, like a death sentence if, you know, you're boozing when you at conception, obviously, yeah. but you know, just food for thought, thinking about that, that, that actually makes a lot of sense that, you know, if it, if you're seeing something that changes your behavior, it's probably changing, you know, your sperm, right. which is pretty crazy to think about. It's also one of those things where, you know, if you listen to all the signs, you're going to live in fear and paralysis by analysis all the time so yeah. it's like you know some things i do i know that are bad for me but i know that i do enough good things that i think it outweighs the bad well there's also someone who said like when you brought that up earlier that's why i brought up uh dr Rhonda patrick is because she talks about that all the time she's like literally the data's in my face all day long and having a kid or kids um she's like i think she just has one boy but regardless she's like i you know i gotta let him go outside and be a boy, you know, I got to let him go wreck his stuff. And it's like, you can't live in a bubble, but at the same time, if there's one thing the human body is great at, 
it's absorbing shit. I mean, we yeah. just throw so much shit at our bodies, left, right, and center. And at the very top of this episode, one of the things you brought up that I was curious, I wanted to get your insight on. Aubrey Marcus talks about this a lot, especially with micronutrients. I love him as well. And, and getting like all these different funk. He says, you know, he's like famous for saying like, eat weird food. Yeah. So you get like a lot of like, you know, his, uh, his analogy of your body being more, like flour is a great example, great depression and America and the, the food pyramid saying like, Hey, you know, whatever, like we need to feed you guys and keep you alive. So like bread's good. Eat a lot of bread because it's cheap. And it'll keep you alive. Mm -hmm. And the body does an amazing job at metastasizing that or not metast metabolizing that into, you know, Aubrey Marcus says like duct tape. It's like, Hey, your body's like, we would prefer this thing, but here's what we yeah. got. So we'll use that over here instead. And when I think about what you're talking about with like figuring out what works best for you, I mean, instead of trying to find a way to cram that square into a, a circle hole, you're actually finding the peg that's meant to go there and the body just runs so much smoother. You know, there's no ethanol in the engine, so to speak. Like it's exactly what your body wants and needs. Same thing yeah. with my mom and dad were fucking hammered on their wedding night when they had me. So, you know, yeah, like, yeah, 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 not yeah, all right, exactly. but you know, yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. And re real quick, what you said, um, you know, about, you know, let the boys, like what Rhonda Packer saying, let the boys be boys. Like they've done studies that owning a pet, like owning a pet, like with like young children dramatically reduces their chance of like autoimmune disorders and allergies and anxiety. Um, in addition, they showed that families that leave their shoes on in the house, those kids actually have lower um, inflammation scores as well. Because if you're taking off your shoes outside the house, you're not bringing those microbes inside of the house. So it's like, where do you draw the line? Like you can't live in mud all the time. You know what I mean? So it's like, how do you balance that? I think it's really, you know, really interesting that you really do. You need to let kids eat shit. You, you got, you got to be around and doing all this stuff because Fingers they need to dirt. build up their immune system, you know, and it's, and going back to, you know, what you said, the square peg with the round hole type thing, you know, I think that's a very great analogy to kind of like how my mind like works, like in general with that, like, for example, like you mentioned that antidepressants being grossly overprescribed and, for example, like, are you, are you guys familiar? I guess I'll say it for the audience, like SSIs, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Those are basically the Premier, the Zoloft, the Prozac. Those are like the main, you go to the doctor and say you're depressed, you're nearly certain going to be put on SSRIs. And what they do is that they elevate the amount of serotonin in your brain. Now, um, when you get prescribed that, do they give you a test to check if your serotonin levels are low? Because what if you have a mutation in dopamine pathways and you have low dopamine, you're going to be elevating your serotonin that's normal and not fixing your low dopamine. The same thing's true if you were to flip it for Adderall. Adderall, like anyone can get a script for Adderall, but they don't check to see if you actually have low dopamine. So basically, like you, some people do need antidepressants. So the, 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 the square peg into the square hole would be if you have a mutation where you either make less serotonin or if you metabolize the serotonin quicker than normal both of those rules result in lower amounts of serotonin so if you give them an ssri that'll directly address their root cause for their disease but i like to think of it as there's different flavors for every type of disease so people with depression for example there's different flavors of it that sounds it's a horrible disease but that's the way i like to look at it is you could have people that have low serotonin you could have people that have low dopamine and a new emergent hypothesis. Some of my buddies, the lab actually right next to me during my PhD are working on um, the inflammatory hypothesis. So um, basically that depression can also be driven by inflammation. So some people can be born with lower than average levels of serotonin all the time. Um, or you can have people that are so stressed or the inflammation can then cause the depression itself. So you know, like you need these medications. Some people are hardwired to fail and they do need that SSRI. But the fact that you tell them you're depressed and they don't check any levels, they don't check any mutations for anything. And then they just throw it out willy nilly. That's the issue I have with it. Yeah. I mean, that was something I have a lot of personal experience with different partners I've been with that have been on those types of medications. And, um, 
one in particular, you know, I, I love the approach that we arrived at when at that time I was experimenting a lot with psychedelics. And, um, you know, one of the things we talk a lot about on the show, you know, the 10 commandments we walk people through is making sure like, just like with any other drug, the, the thing that's beautiful about a, a pharmaceutical company is that it's high grade, you know what you're getting. Right. And so if you're not testing, if you're not self-regulating when you're self regulating, mm -hmm. you don't know what you're going to get. You have no expected outcomes. You have, you know, no standard deviations. You have no expectations of what the outcome could be. And that was one thing that I found in the, the dialogue that we were having about her antidepressants. Cause at that time I had a very staunch view of like, you know, 90% of people shouldn't be on them kind of thing. Mm -hmm. you know, what some kind of abstract number, but through the course of the conversation, one thing that was a very healthy discussion we had was on her side. I got I started to understand that it provided a bit more of a mental cast. It's not something she wanted to be on forever. It was providing a mm -hmm. healing opportunity for her. And that opened a window in my world and something she received from me is while I was asking her, I was like, just like you're pointing out, they weren't testing her serotonin levels or seeing like, what are your different levels? And let's find you know, a nice baseline. They go, here, take this. If that come back, if you have ill side effects, we'll try a different thing. And I'm like, those. yeah, I'm like, well, I don't have all the fucking degrees and knowledge and I could do that. I damn sure could. I could tell you, take this and try it out and let's see. And like, we came to this nice, like middle ground where it was her understanding, like, shit, they are kind of just shooting with some of this. I mean, it's like an educated. Oh, I, I love, I love to use like throwing darts at a dartboard blindfolded. Yeah. You, 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 you could, you know, again, you know, like it's, it's the, it, it's the training system, you know, like think, think what's the average age for a doctor, like a medical doctor. I, I'm not sure, but you know, some of them been practicing medicine and doing a good job at it, helping people's lives for 30 years. And now you're going to throw them this huge curveball. You know, it, it's really, it needs to be changed from the inside out. You know what I mean? I, I have no idea. I have no ideas on how to do that, but it's, it's a, it's a really weird situation. And I think mental health overall now is poorer than ever, you know, and, you know, speaking of what you said, like, in my opinion, I think psychedelics are going to be an absolute breakthrough for not only mental health disorders, but neurodegeneration as well. I mean, whether it's LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, which is like the payo cactus, um, ketamine, DMT, they all elevate the same molecule in your brain. So BDNF, so that's called brain derived neurotrophic factor. Basically that's like gasoline for your brain cells. It lets your brain cells grow. Um, it basically grows brain cells, specifically fine motor neurons, but also overall neurons as well. And basically all these different drugs, you know, psychedelics, you know, people, you know, they do cause a high, people can microdose them, but you could essentially choose what type of vehicle you want, what type of experience you want to have. Because in my opinion, I do think that the actual part of the miracle of the psychedelics is also the experience you have with them on a macro dose, um, the epiphanies you can have during those altered states of consciousness, but also just microdosing itself like has helped so many people. And it's basically elevating your, your, Actually, a study actually just came out many years ago, not many years ago, I think in 2018, there was a study that showed if you grow brain cells in a dish and you drip either DMT, ketamine, or uh, LSD or psilocybin, and you drip it onto the brain cells, you literally see the picture of them, they grow more branches if you drip them on them. And I think literally a couple of weeks ago, couldn't have been more than two weeks ago, a study just came out that showed so in vitro is in the Petri dish. In vivo, like Latin for in, in a living organism, they showed that in mice, you also get the same growth of these brain cells. And um, there's been a huge rise in, in these medicines. And there's been, um, I think they did a study a couple years ago with psilocybin for terminally ill cancer patients. So they know they're going to die. They're going to die very soon. I couldn't even imagine the depression, the depression and anxiety from that. And I forgot the exact number, but it must have been at least 80, 90% of them all had miraculous improvements in their health. And it's one of those things that, you know, if someone's proved A causes B and someone else has proven B causes C, just because no one's proven in a paper that A causes C 
you could confer there. But here's the thing, though, when you're talking about like new medicines, you know, medicines that have been demonized for decades, you know, you do need to actually show in order to get, you know, mainstream, you know, uh, commercial FDA approval, you need to prove that A equals C. And I know there's a lot of companies out there now that are doing these phase two, phase three clinical trials um, for these medicines. Like one that I thought was really interesting was Mind Medicine, um, a publicly traded company, they're actually doing a clinical trial for microdosing LSD for adult ADHD. So I think in a couple of years from now, you're going to have an option. Either you can take Adderall or you can microdose LSD. And something I thought was really interesting is that Adderall actually temporarily increases BDNF. So that's why you feel better to an extent while you're on it. But when you're off it, your BDNF levels are super, super low. So if you think about this, the LSD would be elevating the exact molecule that Adderall can be depleting, if that makes sense. So I just think there's a lot of root causes here. And if it grows new brain cells and it's helping depression patients, why wouldn't it help for, you know, neurodegeneration patients? The data on there is uh, a lot more scarce. That's a much newer frontier here. But in my opinion, I would think if you have some neurogenic compound, so a drug that grows it grows new brain cells and extends existing brain cells. Why would that not help someone whose brain is essentially rotting away? Mm -hmm. Man, and it seems like too, that it, it's, it's going to be a, like you said, a while before it goes down that path where they can do the studies to be able to show that. I'd and say 2025, 2025 psilocybin will be FDA approved. Um, I think 2023 really? MDMA will be FDA approved, but MDMA is different because it doesn't grow new brain cells, but it'll be approved for PTSD. Yeah. So that's that essentially I can, what was that? Oh, so what I was leaning towards is that's kind of like the entry that they've been able to use. It's like, Hey, this is yeah. helping people with, with psychological problems and it's shown. Exactly. They can open up. So you this know, is they, kind they, of like their breakthrough to, to, to inch its way in to be like, Hey, this does help people. And they've shown it. And I think too, the, the way they were able to biggest way they were able to work it in is, is it was able to help the military veterans. And so yeah, they're yeah. actually starting to show to the generals now how, how much of a benefit it is. And really once you start getting to the higher level of the generals that shows like, Hey, this could be a benefit, not only to vets outside of the military, but even to current military people. And they're showing that it could be a benefit. That's how they're breaking it in now into the government, just showing like it helps. I mean, yeah, I feel like even just the regular person, so many people have, you know, had these traumas instilled on them from their upbringing, you know, whether it's conscious or subconscious, these deep seated wounds that, you know, are, are suppressed or, you know, there's a immediate visceral negative aversive response to them. And MDMA specifically could really allow you to I mean, that's how it works for, you know, these veterans. I don't even, I can't even imagine the travesties they've witnessed and experienced. And it's allowing them to, um, it's allowing them to revisit that traumatic experience, but you're not going to immediately shut down and turn away because you're more open to that. And I think the protocol that they were using, I think they were giving them around like 100 or 50 milligrams of MDMA, which isn't a micro dose, you know, that's definitely above threshold, you know, it's not going to be someone, you know, rolling face, you know, at fucking EDC, but it's definitely going to be some, you know, noticeable psychoactive effects. And the fact that that is such a powerful medicine that can really, all else has failed for these people, you know, I think it's just really, really promising. But regarding that, I was going to that because that's a little different because it doesn't actually, it doesn't actually grow new brain cells. Um, but it's, you know, kind of more of an emotional tool. I forgot what company, I forgot what company it was, but they're actually going to try and do um, basically candy flipping. So basically give PTSD patients, anxiety, depression patients, a combination of LSD and MDMA together, because they think combining both will allow you to not only basically have that altered state of consciousness from the LSD and also the BDNF to grow new brain cells and possibly fix the damaged circuitry, but also get the openness from the MDMA to be able to talk more freely about it. Cause I don't know, whenever I talk to someone about anything, like I talk too much about my feelings. Sometimes it's like Tyler, shut up, you know, like I'm very open like that, but I realize that most people are very, you know, guarded with that. And that's definitely a, uh, 
very interesting treatment modality that I think will be rising very rapidly. I mean, just the whole psychedelic sector overall seems very, very appealing. I think actually there's also a company for traumatic brain injury. I think it's Wisana. Um, Mike Tyson actually is one of their main spokespeople. Like, I don't know if he owns part of the company, but they're going to be using, I think, psilocybin, so magic mushrooms to fix um, brain injury athletic endeavors. So like Mike Tyson has been open about how uh, magic mushrooms saved his life because, I mean, think about how much time that guy got hit in the head. You know, the CTE, I don't know if you guys, you know, saw the Aaron Hernandez documentary, you know, all this pounding in the head and stuff. It's similar to kind of like Alzheimer's where these constant concussions are, you know, damaging the brain and the brain slowly starts to rot away. So you introduce something that'll grow new brain cells. You know, I just think it's crazy now, like 10 years ago, you, you, I never would have thought this would be happening. You know what I mean? And I feel like it's, like I said, 2025 for psilocybin, I would say probably by 2028, I would think that maybe not all, but I mean, at least LSD, psilocybin, MDMA, probably DMT as well will probably be um, probably be FDA approved. I mean, a company is doing IV intravenous DMT to treat addiction, which to me just blew my mind. You're just going to straight up shoot up the most powerful hallucinogen in the world. I'm not sure, you know, I don't know what the dosage is of it. You know, I don't think they're blasting off for an hour straight because that would be fucking nuts. Like, I, 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 don't, I don't think they're doing that. That, that, be, that might, we're killing, might be a low amount, but it's just crazy that there's actually publicly traded companies with, I don't know, tens of millions of dollars in market cap that are, you know, doing these things that we said rotted holes in our brain, you know, a couple of decades ago. You know, it, the hippies were right, man. It's, it's crazy. Well, I think that's one of the things that I'm loving about this renaissance is, okay, we figured out where we fucked it up, you know? And when you start to get into the hippie woo-woo side of it, where that, the conspiracy theorist of where it's like talking about control, like, yeah, it, there's not been one time where I went and had a psychedelic experience and I came back and I was like, you know what I fucking love? Taxes laws you know it's like i've never been like yeah dude let me go fucking vote in my district election but one of the things that i think uh top down that people just can't refute is those health benefits you know the the actual proven benefits that come along with these things and maps is doing an amazing job of heading up um, a lot of these private and public companies and making sure it's, it's regulated. And it's the same thing, by the way. Uh, God, I can't remember Hamilton. Uh, oh, Hamilton's pharmacopoeia, my boy. Yeah. Oh, Ed, oh, by the way, add him into the like Frankenstein, like I, ideal version of me in the future. You right? gotta Hamilton more. Oh, he, introduced, he introduced me to Hamilton when we, when I came up to New oh, York yeah. for that, man. Yeah. I love Hamilton's take on like, you know, he's like, imagine cause that, I don't remember what I was listening to some, uh, some kind of content he was putting out and he was like, okay, I get what we're doing with the whole marijuana thing. It went through the tra traditional channels, kind of the same way that you're seeing psychedelics in its reemergence. Hey, it's coming from a health standpoint. We're helping people with PTSD, et cetera, et cetera, antidepressants and things like that. And he goes, imagine making that case for alcohol. You know, like when we went through prohibition and it was like, no, like it's, it's healthy, which by the way, back in the day, it was marketed just like heroin as like a cure-all for headaches and antidepressants and things like that. Way back when it was. It's rid of a bad sore throat, a little bit of moonshine. But like imagine, and that's the <laughs> bullshit we have to deal with now. It's like, yeah, psychedelics have all these amazing benefits, but at the end of the day, I'm a fucking adult. You know, yeah. it's like, if I want to consume that for recreational purposes, hey, let's regulate it recreationally as well as therapeutically. But I understand kind of the, the way the hippies really did fuck it sideways in the 70s and allowed just this narrative to explode. And so we are where we are, and I'm really grateful for where we're at. But I say all that to say, I think the people that understand what's possible with this on both sides, recreationally and therapeutically, are treating it much differently this time around. Everyone's yeah. like, hey, let's be smart about this. Let's take it the right way. Let's be patient and let's do everything we got to do to get it through, to get it rescheduled so that everyone has access to this. Cause this really is some like, you talk about health being at all time, that wokeness being at all time high, obesity is also at all time high, any uh, depressant rates are at all time high. So it's like, it's odd. There's almost this widening of spectrum of sorts. Yeah. And this bleed over could cause like a whole new 
kind of coming together of sorts, you know, I wish I could more eloquently express that, but it seems like a new equilibrium could be exposed by people just having like, Hey, you know what? Yoga is great. Meditation is great. But Sam Harris, you know, to quote him, I could teach you yoga for eight years and there's no guarantee or meditation. There's no guarantee. You'll find the same serenity that I will. You, you may not find that same beautiful sp space, but if I give you 400 micrograms LSD, I can guarantee in about 45 minutes that the weight of your world and existence will come crashing down on your shoulders. So it's a good shortcut. You know, everyone's looking for the magic pill. It might come on paper. I probably, I probably, I probably say like 150 maybe to start. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, man, like you were saying, like, I also want to point out too, you know, like there are psychedelics are definitely different from like marijuana or alcohol because there are some people that should not use them period and this I'm is kind of a cool that segue that, that like i know i forgot the company but they're actually partnered with a genetic testing company so you can actually do you could get a genetic like you could get a 23 in may that'll assess genes that will predict how you respond to psychedelics it's a psychedelic like response kit basically now in my opinion you know, you could get 23 of me and analyze it. I think you pay like, like you pay like a hundred bucks for like nine genes versus 23 and me is 47,000 for, you know, but it's all prim and proper. But the fact that you're having these co psychedelic companies that are actually like utilizing genetic approaches to pre-screen people, you know, I think that's really, really important as well. And, you know, I, I think, again, a lot of it comes down to as well, it all centers around BDNF. Now, that's what causes the growth in the new brain cells. Now, I always tell people, you know, people that don't want to, you know, try and experience psychedelics, like what things can you do to elevate BDNF? Guess what? Intense exercise, sunlight, but also magnesium. Magnesium, so many people are deficient in it. Like it's a huge epidemic of magnesium deficiency. And interestingly enough, magnesium actually works in the body the same way that ketamine does. So magnesium blocks the same receptor, the NMDA receptor, just like ketamine. So obviously it's much, much, much less potent, but I don't know if you've heard that magnesium is good for sleep. Well, ketamine is a tranquilizer and it's basically just a much more potent version. So they've shown that taking, taking magnesium, it's basically like, it's basically like doing a tiny, tiny microdose of ketamine, if you will, because it's doing the same effect in your body and elevating your BDNF levels. Magnesium, curcumin, and CBD. CBD has also been shown to grow new brain cells through BDNF. So me personally, I take CBD every day. Like it just helps me calm down a lot. And people that chronic stress and anxiety also lowers your BDNF. So people that feel lost and just feel like, I always like to use the analogy, when I'm really overworked, I feel like you're trying to hang on to a rope that's flying through your hands. You just can't get a grip and hang on to it. So if you feel like just life's moving too fast, you're too overwhelmed, you can't focus, and you're stressed, it's probably a BDNF issue. And you know, if you don't want to try and self-medicate, I'm not saying everyone go out and try and do that. Like, get some magnesium. I'll get magnesium glycinate, magnesium threonate. Like those both have very high bioavailability. And CBD taken consistently over time, those two combined, guaranteed to elevate your BDNF levels. Um, like I tell people that CBD, I keep a bottle at work. So everyone's heard of CBD. If I'm anxious, I take it. I'm not anxious anymore. Out of supplements I've tried, it's by far the most effective. Um, but also taking it every single day long term will elevate the BDNF in your brain and help you have a more stable mood because you'll literally be elevating the exact cause for your anxiety, if that makes sense. Like you're kind of coming full circle here that if you're if you're keeping the BDNF levels up higher, you're not really going to get anxious to begin with. Mm. Yeah, I, for one, am stoked about the amount of knowledge that came out of this. I don't know if you've been telling <laughs> I've, I've been taking notes <laughs> during I'm this. Just, I, every time you <laughs> took notes, I would have been like, oh, I would have definitely run that. hundred <laughs> percent, man. I think, you know, Tyler, thanks so much for coming on, man. I think that um, I speak for everybody when we play this back. This has been for sure one of the most insightful podcasts we've ever done well i really appreciate that man i can't wait to come back man i'll come up more knowledge hit it harder than ever you know we'll do an extended set you know whatever we yeah. gotta do keep it going man uh you know i really want to you know thank you for letting me use your, use your platform you know people 
people are lost. You know what I mean? I mean, like I just said there, magnesium, CBD, if you feel really lost, give it two, three weeks, I'll guarantee you, you'll be feeling better, you know? And it's, some people want to go down that hard route, not hard route, but I guess in today's world, it's you, you'd less and less of extremist route, the psychedelic route, but you know, it, 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 and actually real quick, like meditation and yoga have actually also been shown to elevate BDNF. So every, everything that is healthy to do yeah exercise sunlight yoga meditation like magnesium they all elevate bdnf so when you take them away and add this fucked up go 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 world bdnf drops down low and you're anxious depressed in the spiral and can't get out of it you know so but yeah man thank you both for having me on and i will definitely be back if i get the invite hey if people want to connect with you where can they find you uh, at T Pansner on Instagram. Spell that out. P-A-N-T-P-A-N-Z-N-E-R. Cool. Yeah, we'll be sure. Yeah, well, I, I think I'm going to make an official Dr. Tyler Pansner Instagram soon too, because it's, you know, I, I want to. You have to. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I got to get on that. Yeah, because we're going to be making clips too. A lot of the stuff he was writing down, we'll make little clips. I'll just take my notes. If anybody would like, uh, you know, a signed copy of my notes for this episode, just (laughs) shout us out. We can get you to sign. You know what? If I if if I if I don't do that, if I don't do that tonight, I'm gonna do that tomorrow. I've been meaning to do that for so long. So get on it. Here's the sign. Cool. Well, hey, if you love this episode, please share it with someone you know, someone you love. And if you have any recommendations or feedback for us, remember Dylan doesn't give a shit. So hit me up on Instagram. I'm at Colton DM. <laughs> this is at Dylan Wooden. And of course, you got at Dr. Tyler coming soon tomorrow. We'll promote that, promote that uh on our Instagram as well. For sure. Awesome. All, All right, right, guys. You made a great evening. Great catching up, Dylan. And I will uh speak to you guys soon, hopefully. Cheers, guys. Cheers, bye. See you.